is the Tamron 20 to 75 millimeters F 2.8 DXD G2 worth the upgrade over the first generation? Should this be your first consideration for a standard F 2.8 aperture zoom for the E-mount system? In this review, I'll cover these questions and more to help you decide on how to spend your hard earned money before your wife spends it all. <coughs> Chapters are in the description, so let's get started. The Tamron 28-75 RXD was an extremely popular lens for its time. However, times have changed, there's new competition on the market, and Tamron has really upped their game with this VXD model. Let's get started with build and handling. Let me start off by saying I love the aesthetics of this lens. For weight savings, Tamron uses a composite material which is basically plastic like a Kardashian. Starting off at the bottom is a weather sealing gasket. This lens is fully weather sealed. Even the front element has a bead resistant coating. Moving on is a USB-C connector for firmware updates, additional focus features, or simply an assignable button. A real shame it didn't include an autofocus manual focus switch. The manual focus ring is basic and it can be controlled by Tamron lens utility. The zoom ring has these ridges that are a bit sharp, however they do grip well. The hood is rather basic and gets the job done. The lens has 67mm filter threads, 4.6 inches long or 117mm. 540 grams or 19 ounces and can focus down to as close as 7.1 inches or 0.18 meters which is really really close that's a 1.27 magnification and on the telephoto it's 1 to 4.1 and that is extremely close as well. RxD, VxD, what's the difference? Well, RxD was Tamron's mid-tier autofocus system and VxD is Tamron's high-end autofocus system. So let's get into it, autofocus. Both of these tests were done on the same camera. One is the 2470 G Master, the other is the Tamron 28-275 VxD. Can you tell which is which? I'll give you one second. Time for the reveal. Yes, the Tamron is a little bit slower. On some of these shots, you can see that it does lag just a little bit before catching up. This next test is in an extreme low light scenario. Here is the 2470 GM struggling a bit. It may look like video, however, it's the A1 going full speed. And now I'll cut over to the Tamron 28275 VXD. This lens manages to get 15 frames per second on an Alpha 1. And the autofocus is about as sticky as the chewing gum beneath my shoe. Indeed, very difficult to get loose. Among the last few frames, it does lose focus briefly and then reacquires right away. In good lighting, it really didn't have much issues tracking this low flying bird. This is with an A7 Mark III. The RxD model was great for its time. However, it's been surpassed. Let's take a look at sharpness. To recap a little, I did a comparison between the Tamron 28-275 Mark I and Sigma 28-270 and the Sigma is just a little bit sharper. So I'll be comparing to the Sigma 28-270 since it's a sharper lens. 28 millimeters wide open. The Tamron has a little bit more bite. You can see everything's just a little bit sharper. Here's the edge for a corner and everything is just a little bit sharper. This is at f2.8. Moving on to F4 and the Tamron extends the lead. Sigma did get better, Tamron extended it. In the center, they're pretty much the same. At 5.6, I think the Tamron has just a little bit more contrast. And in the edge, far corners, there's just a little bit more definition with the Tamron images. At F8, I think the Sigma catches up. Everything looks fairly comparable at this point. Moving on to 35 millimeters, 100%. The Tamron is just a little bit more crispy. Going towards the far edges, like I said, the Tamron stays a little bit more crispy. Going down to F4, the Tamron gets even sharper and it expands the lead just a little bit. At 5.6, the Sigma gets really close. However, it lags behind just a bit. Tamron is probably at its max. At F8, they are fairly comparable. I would say the Sigma might be even sharper as uh, the Tamron may have dropped off sharpness a tiny, tiny bit. It's kind of hard to see the difference between the two. Moving to 70 on the Sigma and 75 on the Tamron. And wow, the Tamron is in a different league. It's just so much sharper in the center. This is wide open. 
moving towards the edge and the Tamron has a slight lead. You can see that it's not super crispy on this fencing material. At F4, the Sigma catches up dramatically. At the edge, the Tamron maintains the lead. However, it's not by a whole lot. At 5.6, once again, the Tamron is a little bit sharper and has a little bit more magnification. At F8, at the edges, they are fairly comparable. I would give a slight edge to the Tamron still. This bike just looks a little bit more crisp. In the center, it looks like the Sigma is a tad bit sharper in the center. And I would say overall, the sharpness is somewhat comparable, but the Tamron is much better wide open. Distortion has a direct impact with sharpness. At 28 millimeters, there is barrel distortion, and immediately following, there is pincushion, and it gets worse all the way to 75 millimeters. The older lens was known for occasional busy background. How does this new lens fare? Let's take a look at bokeh. Can you tell between the old and the new? Tried my best to match the coloring, so excuse me if it's off. Time for the reveal. At 70 millimeters f2.8, there's less bokeh outlining with the VXD model. Not too dramatic, but noticeable. For this next comparison, I don't feel that the G1 comparison was comparable, so this is a bonus. Can you guess which is which? Here it is. At this particular distance, I found that the G2 was better among these three. The bokeh is smoother, less prone to donut-shaped bokeh. If that makes any sense, there's less of that donut outlining. Overall, I thought the bokeh of the Tamron was outstanding at any price point. For reference, here's 35 millimeters and 50 millimeters. Up next, we'll be looking at apparitions of this lens, how much correction is needed. We'll be looking at CA and LOCA, aka Boca CA. Let's have a look. At 28 millimeters, there is virtually no loca. As you can see, there's no purple or greens. It's very minor, if any. Moving on to 49 millimeters. Once again, there's very little or no outlining going on. You can see right here, it's just a very, very minor amount. It starts to creep at 75, and even then it's a fairly low amount. You can see the purple and green Boca CA. Moving on to Loca, I found it was worse at 28, and even then it's probably within the range of other lenses, like the Sigma 28 to 70 or the G Master. Here you can see it. And moving on to 42 millimeters, it starts to dwindle down. There's hardly any. This is 100% in a torture test. You can barely see it. Moving on to 75 millimeters, and this is where it's, it's virtually gone at this point. And this is 75 millimeters once again. Moving towards the middle of the frame, there is none. And the edge, I mean, there's hardly any right here. What happens if we get some light in our lens? Let's take a look at flare and sun stars. The pattern is minimal and unintrusive. It's free from heavy ghosting, which would wash out an image. Here is 35 millimeters and more of the same. This continues on all the way to 75. There isn't any real flaring problems and your images and video will look nice and retains contrast through the range. At 28 millimeters, the sun stars are quite nice. However, it does increase the flare. Moving to 40 millimeters and it retains pretty well and it increases the flare even more. At 75 millimeters, it's less prominent. However, it's still pretty darn good and the flare is quite heavy. Cameras these days aren't only used for stills anymore. Let's have a look at the video performance. At 28 millimeters, there is a mild yet noticeable amount of focus breathing. Have a look here. At 35 millimeters, there is virtually no focus breathing. This is the sweet spot of this lens. At 50 millimeters, the focus breathing reverts back to how it behaves at 28. It got a little bit worse. At 75 millimeters, the focus breathing declines a little bit. And overall, this lens has a decent performance. Not great, not bad. The Tamron 28-75 VXD is focused in the center, and this is for the parfocal test. 
you can see that it will drift and is not a parfocal lens. Talk about the main drawback of this lens and I would say it's the inconsistencies. It's lacking the AF MF switch which the 150 to 500 and the 35 to 150 has. It's also missing that custom 1, 2 and 3 switch that would have made usability much higher because this lens button implementation is done very well and it's very easy to use. So you'd be using those buttons all the time. Another one is that this button has no way of letting you know that your settings have been saved. So it would have been nice if there was an LED indicator to let you know that, hey, your settings have been changed. Otherwise, you're just in the dark and you just have to trust the system. The elephant in the room is 28 millimeters. Is that wide enough for you? Only you can make that call. Of course, you're saving size and weight because of that 28 millimeters, but it's still a thing. So that's one of a major downfall. Other than that, this lens is extremely reasonable in size. It feels great. It has a lot of extras with Tamron lens utility. Very easy to recommend this lens to anyone on the E-mount system. Of course, there's the Sigma, which performs nearly as well, has a half inch size advantage, and that's a noticeable amount according to every Asian ever. Coming in at $899, I think the lens is well priced, and considering how well it performs, I think it's an extremely nice upgrade and a great addition for E-mount users. Coming into the system, if you're okay with 28 millimeters as your starting point. Thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it and see you on the next one. Take care.